What is geometry? That is the question. I am Andrus Kulikowskas. This is Math for Wisdom. This is the first video in hopefully a long series where I show how I investigate mathematics. In particular, for about a month or so, I want to investigate what is geometry. And so today, I'll be talking about how I'll be investigating that, and also why I'll be investigating that, and uh, what I sort of think geometry is, uh, at least uh, at this point, what's my working hypothesis? I think geometry is uniformity of choice. So by that, I mean that uh, for a problem or a situation or a discipline to be geometrical, it means that you have the same type of choice available at many different locations. So, for example, you could be uh, in two dimensions, but if you were in two dimensions here, but in three dimensions there, in seven dimensions over somewhere else, you know, and it was just all razzle-dazzle scattered, that's not really geometry. Geometry is like where it's two dimensions everywhere, okay? And so then that uh, gives you uh, something to play with because you can maybe pick up your whole space and translate it. Or at least you know that uh, you can make certain assumptions in one place. You can make certain choices in one place. And you have corresponding choices that you may or may not make in another place. And so you have a arena for a particular type of choice, right? That's what's geometry. And so um, that's my hunch. And I'm trying to uh, get uh, evidence for that. And so I really have to understand geometry better. So why don't I give a bit of an overview? This is a map of uh, the ways, the many ways, maybe 50 ways or, or, or ultimately maybe more of how I could investigate geometry. I don't have to do them all, but it's good to think about them. And then we'll consider more about like why, and then we'll go back to this how. But what you can see is basically there's three kinds of ways I could be approaching this. One here on the left is um, the psychology of geometry, you know, that uh, there's uh, spatial intuition, for example. Uh, there's uh, ways of figuring things out, which means that uh, there's not just geometry on the paper or in the sand, but there's geometry or something like it in the mind, okay? Or at least tools for the mind, and those tools can help us to think what is geometry, right? And so for the problem solving, uh, we can look at uh, math in general and compare with that. We can look, we can focus on problem solving in geometry. We can look at uh, specific domains, which would be like, let's say, plane geometry in two dimensions. But there's four kinds that I really interesting to learn more about. Uh, affine geometry, projective geometry, conformal geometry, symplectic geometry. And so those terms will keep coming up today. And this is kind of cute, uh, but... Uh, as you can see, I've got all these ways of uh, investigating geometry. I could organize and study the ways of investigating geometry and maybe even make a diagram about that. So we'll conclude a bit about that. But you can see part of the results right here is that there's these three groupings, right? One is uh, what I call innate, which includes spatial intuition, okay? And so that could start like with child's uh, development. So, and there's a Van Heel model of stages. Those stages are important because uh, for uh, education, if a teacher, for example, is talking about uh, triangles and the child has a different notion of what a triangle is, you know, like maybe more um, just loose, you know, the, the teacher may think very strictly that they have to be straight lines, but the child may not think in terms of straight lines. So uh, that's something where there could be a disconnect. So it's important to understand how the, ch and if the child development can also give clues. Also, somebody like uh, Piaget learned different things about how children, uh, just in general, um, master uh, what's bigger, what's smaller. Uh, so, for example, children will look at a 
very thin but tall cylinder, and if it's full of juice, and let's say they like the juice, they'll prefer that over a broad but uh, shallower, even though the one the other one may have much more volume, you see. So when you grow older, you realize it's the volume that matters. It's not the height that matters, right? But little children are kind of go for the height. So these types of things may be revealing in terms of what geometry is. And uh, we can talk about um, geometry from the point of view of uh, ordinary people. Uh, but we can talk to people who are professional modern geometers who may actually not work very much with shapes at all. So it becomes interesting, like, what are you what are you studying? And what makes, let's say, geometry, geometry as opposed to topology, as opposed to, let's say, just uh, studying metric systems or spaces or vector spaces? Why, what, what, where, where does it become one and not the other? Uh, we can look at people uh, like artists uh, who have spatial intuition. What do they think about uh, geometry? Or uh, directors, like in theater or film, how do they stage for the, you know, how do they set up their actors and, and the events that they're portraying? How do they, uh, you know, choose their movie shots? What's the vocabulary that they have? See, that type of vocabulary may be very geometric. They can give insights. What do we mean by geometry? And then overall, this idea of beauty, you see. So uh, what's beautiful? Uh, that can give clues in terms of, you know, like what's beautiful about geometry. It may be that the most beautiful geometry is really the most uh, essential for geometry. Or maybe not, but these are clues. So these are all what I call innate um, much of what this is, it's kind of like the inborn machinery, you know, that we're born with. And then here on the opposite side, there's cultural things. So these are things that kind of come from the real world and maybe would be different for a different planet uh, or different, uh, just because of the historical developments would be different. So that would include the goals, the requirements, the applications. Uh, but just for starters, like the etymology, which would be like the history of words. So if we compare Chinese and Greek, you know, how do the Chinese, you know, what word do they use for geometry? Like in Greek, I think geometry means measuring the earth. Um, but whereas, uh, I'm not quite sure, but I think like in Chinese, it would be something, I mean, it's jiha. I think it's something like, you know, how many, way, you know, how many, and then measuring how many, something like that. So it's basically different. So, um, or for example, circle or square or triangle, you know, is it three angles or is it three points or is it something else, you know, who knows? So um, the, the, just uh, thinking about that, maybe give some clues. Um, studying the history, how it unfolded, uh, looking for paradigm shifts. So for example, the introduction of uh, projective geometry was a huge advance. Uh, and I think it came from, let's say, Renaissance artists wanting to, uh, you know, learning how to draw uh, images that look three-dimensional, okay? Where you may have uh, points connecting at infinity at a point, lines connecting at infinity at a point, right? And so it gives the impression that, uh, you know, or like you've seen like railroad tracks, they, they're parallel, but they end up meeting at the, at the horizon or things could be meeting at the horizon. That's another way to do it. So that type of paradigm shift, and a lot of the times those paradigm shifts come with key individuals. So if you look at geometry, like who are the individuals who shook things up, right? Grotendieck is a modern example, okay? Just kind of redid the foundations of algebraic geometry. And so uh, if we look at those, like what did they do? What was the shift? That's something we can do. And, you know, how did the concepts change? What concepts got introduced? Why? And uh, it also can uh, happen through um, applications. So, you know, what's the history of geometry? Uh, as I mentioned, you know, it could be about business. It could be about landholding, you know, me measuring the earth um, and seeing what parcels are equal or, you know, you know, what should the taxes be on a certain part of land? How do you know that someone's not uh, hiding some of their harvest, you know? Try to figure out uh, what you could expect to get from a piece of land. Uh, it could be about uh, the trades, you know? It, it could be about architecture, like building pyramids or all kinds of buildings. It could be the art and what people found beautiful over the ages. Uh, certainly, like, think of Islamic art is very geometrical. 
astronomy is ancient and that has a um, geometric um, feature to it also, which changes around the around the ages. So, for example, Kepler um, was able to show that the orbits are not uh, spherical; they're actually elliptical. Right? So, an ellipses are part of geometry, we could say. And then another uh, way to look at it, and this um, this may come from the cultural picture. Uh, this may not necessarily, but what are the goals of geometry? Why do people do geometry? And uh, that could include simply uh, curiosity or, or beauty or not having anything better to do. But still, uh, if you think of the goals, uh, that can help identify like what is geometry um, and the requirements for doing geometry. So it could be, for example, tools uh, like um, the Greeks were using a straight edge and they were using a compass. So you have lines and circles, okay? Uh, Descartes introduced the Cartesian uh, plane. It's named after him. And so you have coordinate systems. And so um, that leads to algebraic geometry, where like you can have certain curves uh, that are simply uh, known, especially because uh, they're actually maybe easy to do algebraically. You get these interesting shapes if you plot them out. And so algebraic geometry studies... Uh, basically like algebra as a tool for constructing uh, shapes, which typically means cross-sections uh, through some kind of, uh, like, you know, by setting things equal to zero. Okay, so you'll be getting some kind of cross-section, and you can study what are the possible cross-sections? How do you assemble things? So the real heart of the matter, what is geometry from geometry's point of view? Because, you know, innate is kind of like, well, we have this in our minds, uh, without any experience, it's all built in. Culture would be like, oh, we have certain experience. We live in a particular world uh, where it um, it just encourages us to uh, act geometrically, to to pursue geometry as an as a discipline. But there's a logic in geometry itself, is there, that kind of helps to define itself as a discipline. And the challenge in, in all of these approaches and just in general uh, for a definition is like, I'm not looking to talking about geometry as a word. The idea is that is there a concept, a uh, intuitive concept, uh, perhaps a very deep intuitive concept that um, doesn't really care what you call it, but is uh, really has some coherence. You know, when you use that concept, when people train in that, when they try to learn to think that way, uh, they kind of get stuck in that way, maybe to say, or they have that mode of thinking, the geometric mode of thinking. In mathematics, that does seem to be the case. Uh, that's maybe one reason why I'm not afraid to pursue this. I'm a mathematician. Um, and so um, I want to, um, uh, well, so we'll be explaining shortly why I'm pursuing this. Um, but one reason is uh, I'm the host of Math for Wisdom. I'm interested to know everything, apply that usefully. Uh, I've come up with a language of cognitive frameworks, um, and I'd like to show in advanced mathematics that they actually appear there. I host and lead a small community. You're welcome to join us. We have a discussion group by email. Uh, you can find it at mathforwisdom.com. And um, I'm trying to encourage us um, to use three minds, and they actually relate to these three ways. You know, of course, we have a unconscious that's very snappy and knows all the answers. It has hard, you know, has the sum of all our personal experience. That's a bit like this cultural side. The point is, is that um, that's just uh, one mind. And, uh, okay, it's kind of like the Google mind. Okay, you can give me one answer to any question. You can Google what is geometry, you'll get an answer. Or you can ask ChatGPT. But it's kind of stupid. It can't tell you why it got that answer, you know, like, so we want something more. Um, then there's the innate mind. It's able to, uh, it's kind of like the conscious. It's able to unplug the unconscious, remove it and say, okay, let's ask questions, right? So you ask questions. Uh, that's maybe why it's like, I think that like problem solving, right? Uh, or it's using space basically as a blank slate. So an important idea by Kant, uh, the philosopher Immanuel Kant, is that space and time are what we're left with uh, when we remove all the objects. Okay, So it's like the blank slate. So we have the questioning mind, we have the answering mind, but the crucial thing that I'm trying to um, 
encouraged with math for wisdom uh, when the whole point of having a language of wisdom and, and trying to be wise is to create a space between the questions and the answers. Okay, so like uh, psychologist Daniel Kahneman and his colleague, uh, uh, I think Amos Tversky, uh, looked at these two minds and they said, they call them system one and system two. System one thinks fast, system two thinks slow. And I'm trying to say there's a system three, what I call consciousness, which thinks basically stopped. It's able to stop the thinking. <laughs> I keep thinking of this movie, The Matrix, uh, where they are fighting, there's a fight scene and they kind of stop everything and the bullets are just hanging in the air, right? And they can kind of screw it around and whatever. So that's what we want to do with our minds is to just let it stop. And so in that in-between space, you have a mind that's kind of like monitoring uh, the relationship between the, what I've written here is innate and cultural, but really the uh, conscious and the unconscious. It's able to monitor that and investigate that connection. And so you get to see, uh, it's kind of like the mind that's left over when you unplug the unconscious and you unplug the conscious, you unplug your whole neural networks, and you unplug the conceptual language, you know, of 100,000 concepts that you've used to using and say, I don't want to use those concepts. I want to start from scratch, like a baby in the womb, let's say. And I want to um, consider the language of cognitive frameworks that's even more uh, innate, so to speak. And what do things like look from that point of view? What is it like to live a life of inquiry where we just pause on answering our questions and we proceed? And so partly for my community, partly for myself, I just want to show like there's just dozens of ways to investigate something. OK, and so we're running through them. But some of them are actually go to the deep heart of the matter. Like, is there an intrinsic um, understanding uh, to avail of like, well, what do we mean by geometry? Right. Above and beyond what the dictionary would tell you, let's say. Right. So. Here are some ways to study that. You can think of more, Re leave that in the comments. But if I start uh, down here, well, of course, definitions. So it is valid, you know, to look and see what uh, various dictionaries or encyclopedias are going to write about this. But really, like, I'm going to be interested in looking at the definitions that the great geometers, great mathematicians have written. So I'm still in the process of collecting that. That'll be future videos, uh, quite possibly the next one I'll do or, or the one after that. And category theory is a very important uh, branch of mathematics. It's been called the math about math. Um, so we'll look a little bit about that even today. And the philosophy of math is something to look at. And so to keep eyes on some key notions, uh, just to think independently, like uh, where does geometry come into these things? So kind of like flipping around instead of saying, what are the concepts of geometry? Saying These are concepts that are clearly important. And when do they become geometrical or not? And that includes assembling, you know, figures into other figures, uh, uh, constructing, making different shapes, like with the straight edge and compass. Congruence, which means that shapes and figures are the same or not. Uh, are they are they congruent? Uh, and that relates to translating and relates to symmetry. Like what 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 can you do to a shape without changing it? Um, what can you do to uh, you know space where uh, that would fall apart or break apart? Dimension, as I mentioned, it's uh, related to this whole issue of choice. And you can think of each dimension as an additional choice, and you can think of their relationship as the relationship between choices, which becomes very uh, sophisticated. And embedding. So um, you can think of, uh, it's very common, like we'll have a surface, like a sphere even, like our planet. You can think of it in three dimensions, embedded it in three dimensions. You could think of it embedded in Minkowski space-time, which is a very uh, particular type of four-dimensional uh, time where three uh, four dimensional sp space where three dimensions are what they call space like and one is time like and there's a metric that has to kind of uh, treat the space ones let's say positive uh, the the positive squares and then the time one will be a negative square you have to worry about that but anyways the point being that you can embed a sphere in a different space or you can think of the sphere intrinsically with regard to itself, as if there was not embedded in anything. Just what's it like to live on that sphere? Okay. So uh, the embedding is an important notion. 
Uh, and so one of the things uh, we can do um, is to look at the fields in mathematics um, that uh, surround and relate and give context for geometry. And I'll do that. I'll show a map and you'll see geometry is very central. So that's interesting between algebra and analysis. And Lie theory is actually like the belly button of math when you draw it out. And so we'll talk about that. It's the math of continuous groups. So groups are systems of actions that you can do and undo and compose. And uh, Lie groups are the ones that can be done continuously. So like with a circle, you can rotate it as little or as much as you want. Okay, but especially as little part that you're able to do these small, small changes. Uh, that's what Lie theory is uh, has the power to do, uh, to, 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 to assume. Then matroids is another type of uh, branch of mathematics that's important because uh, a lot of geometry is built on uh, linear algebra, you know, which is built talking about like vector spaces and how you transform one vector space into another or into itself. And when you deal with those maps, uh, you're uh, dealing with um, independence of vectors. Are they truly independent? So do you have like a nice choice of, let's say, two or three vectors that are not just copies of the same thing, you know, or you can't get the third from the other two. So like, you know, if you have three vectors, but they're all in a plane, that doesn't count as three dimensional geometry. But if you have three vectors and they form a volume, then you can start to talk about three-dimensional geometry, or maybe they even are perpendicular, and then you have very convenient basis. So you have this notion of independence, but and somehow just having vectors, spaces by themselves is not quite geometry. Typically, you'll add a uh, notion of distance, for example, by having an inner product. Okay, And so you can have different kinds of inner products. You can get different kinds of geometry. That'll be exciting. That's what I'm very interested in. So, but the point being that um, before we get there, but underlying that, maybe very close to that, uh, like the picture frame, so to speak, of geometry, maybe matroids in the sense that matroids are the combinatorial structures that, um, almost like a combinatorial way of thinking, that uh, deals with those requirements that, um, ground this type of independence because uh, it can apply to vectors but it can also apply to uh, very different things like graphs you know and so it's not a subject i know really about but i think it's something to be in mind of something i know even less about uh, there are groupoids and then what john bias calls uh, spans of groupoids and so he has some papers uh, and he's of course always an inspiration so he has some papers where he talks about lee theory in terms and Dinkin diagrams in terms of these spans of groupoids. And basically groupoids would be, um, if I get this right, uh, uh, their category, like if you know what a category is, which is basically like uh, uh, objects and arrows between those objects uh, that satisfy composition. Okay. Then if you, if every arrow uh, has an inverse, Okay, so if you go from A to B, there's a way to go back, uh, which composes to give you identities on either side. That would be considered inverse, and so that'd be called a groupoid. If you have a very simple category with only one object, and you have these inverses, well, then that's basically what a group is. It's like you just ignore the object and just look at the relationships between the arrows to and from that object, and they will have a group structure. So groupoid is, you could say, a generalization of the group. And so spans of groupoids, which would be like mapping groupoids. And I think it's kind of like, you know, if you have a matrix and it has uh, entries I and J, I think it's like having a groupoid for the I and a groupoid for the J. I'm just making that up. But I think that's kind of like what's going on there. So then another thing I just threw in here, Grassmannians are going to be very important, especially for why I'm interested. Grassmannians uh, have to do with the way of embedding a vector space into another vector space. Okay. So, um, and they, they, it's kind of like a way of, uh, well, making that into a new space, but also related to counting problems um, regarding that. And so uh, what are the possible flavors of these Grassmannians? That's, that's, I think it's told by bot periodicity, which is, you know, the exciting word at Math for Wisdom. If you can always say, well, how long will it take? How many minutes will happen before Andres 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 mentions bot periodicity. So this, if this is what you guessed, you win your prize. 
that's uh, the game up uh, right now. Now, one way of looking at this map, and I'll show you kind of a map I've done, I think I should redo it, uh, but what are the related fields to geometry? So for example, how does geometry become topology? And it's quite revealing. Like, so topology would be like a Mobius strip. If you've seen a, if you've taken a strip of paper and then you've twisted one end and you glue them together and then you know, like, you know, pretend you're an ant and you walk around, you can walk all around once and you end up on the other side. And if you walk around twice and you end up back where you started, that's a very clever, uh, interesting structure, which has a topology, but that's not really considered a geometry. <laughs> So what's going on there? Like, why? It's a shape, right? Why is that shape not geometrical? Uh, and so that's a question. Are these things just arbitrary? But it, there seems to be a, a hint where this is leading. And it may kind of relate to the uniformity of choice. You see, everywhere on that strip is flat. So from every location's point of view, it looks the same. Actually, it probably looks quite the same globally, even, you know, potentially. Like, in a certain, maybe that's not entirely true. But certainly, like, locally, it's... It's a flat space. Um, you know, if you can only walk so far and you pretend that that's like walking off to infinity, you know, like from like us on the planet, you know, for, for thousands of years, we just thought it was flat, I think, uh, and with good reason, because basically it is kind of flat. So um, that's geometry, right? Uh, but when you look at the big locally, but when you look at the big picture, what can, what are the ways of gluing things together, you know, like, you know, how many ways, you, it turns out there's not that many ways. There's huge constraints on what you can do, right? Okay, they flipped everything upside down. Okay, that's one way. But uh, there's not that many ways to do things like that. Maybe with a strip of paper, that's the only thing you can do, you know? So, so then topology studies those limitations. And so topology is a little bit over. And so also, you can look at, of course, uh, subfields. Uh, so there's all these different types of branches of geometry. There's differential geometry and algebraic geometry and computational geometry and, and maybe combinatorial geometry, etc. And it goes on. And there's branches of different kinds of geometries. But the, I think that so the question is like, you know, when does uh, when does it shift over to combinatorics? When does it become more algebraic and or more geometric? You know, uh, what's what's happening here? So. That's a good thing to think about. That should be revealing. Another way, uh, especially as this becomes a concrete, you know, the more the more better an answer you have, the more you can think in terms of the opposite, what I call here anti-geometry. So if I'm claiming that geometry is the uniformity of choice, well, can I push that and say, okay, well, what happens if it's absolutely not uniform, right? Uh, so like, you know, you just have all these crazy dimensions or whatever. So that'd be one thing. Uh, and I don't know, but but it, it certainly does feel like it's not becoming geometrical anymore. Like if you have to, if if every time you move, you end up in a different world, uh, and you really not, you don't really feel like you're in any world at all. You know, so there's really nothing to to say. Um, so I think that that's one way to think about it. You know, or what's a non-choice, uh, and that's very interesting. Uh, another uh, math for wisdom word we'll probably hear more frequently is the field with one element. So. Uh, real numbers, uh, a field is basically an arithmetical system that's absolutely complete. You got your addition, you got your subtraction, you got your multiplication, you got your division, you got a zero, you have a one. And so typical, like, you know, integers are not a, uh, like natural numbers are not a field because you don't have the minus numbers, the negative numbers. And integers are not because you don't have the division, uh, like one third is not an integer. Uh, but rational numbers are a field, uh, real numbers are a field, complex numbers are a field, quaternions are not because you don't have commutativity, but they're kind of close, you know, octonians are not uh, because they don't have commutativity and they don't have uh, associativity, but they're also kind of close to a field, um, so sometimes you kind of like play with it, not someone like me, <laughs> I don't have the skills for that, but maybe someday, but uh, a clock well, a clock uh, is an arithmetic system. So if it's a 12-hour clock, um, the problem with a 12-hour clock, although it's a beautiful uh, integer type of system, is that uh, 6 times 2 is 12, which is 0. 12 functions like 0. You know, like 3 plus 12 is 3. So 12 is like 0. 6 times 2 is 12, which is 0. That causes uh, problems in arithmetic. It makes things, I think... Um, it just makes you don't not have unique solutions in different situations, okay? 
uh, there's too many ways that you can, you know, get A plus B equals zero and A and B could be all kinds of things and it's just not very interesting. Maybe I'm probably not being very uh, precise here or correct, but the point being that like if you had a seven hour clock, see seven's a nice number because it's prime and then um, you're not going to get anything times anything equal to seven except for one times seven. And so then, uh, like if you, I think the one way to, that shows this is completely tangential, but not maybe not entirely. Like if you do um, division, like if you go seven times seven is 14. Okay, you get a four times uh, uh, plus seven, seven plus seven is 14. Plus seven is 21, you get a one, which is different than four and seven. Plus another seven, 28 is again different, the eight. Plus seven is 35 is again different, five. Plus seven is 42 is again different, you get a two. Plus seven is a 49, uh, nine is again different. Plus seven is uh, 56, six is again different. Plus seven is uh, 63, three is again. Plus seven is uh, 70, zero again, plus seven, seven. Now you get again, but you ran through all 10 possibilities. You see, you didn't get any kind of repeating as you would with, let's say, fives. That's because seven and 10 are uh, relatively prime. Okay, I guess so it's not really quite having to do with that, but you kind of get the notion that like, you know, when you're prime, then you're uh, just in a world on your own uh, where everything is different. Keeps, keeps Everything gets kind of keeps staying different, segregated in that type of way. The point of that though, was that, um, well, there's one point is that you can have geometry where you, instead of having the rational numbers or real numbers, you say, oh, I just want to have seven points, let's say possible, right, on my line. You see, and then then how many things can you have in a plane, you see, and et cetera. Like, it becomes interesting, like you can still do geometry, you can still have lines and they can still intersect and you can have a triangle, let's say, but the whole world becomes very tiny and that may be very useful. So I've actually kind of snuck up here to basic geometry. Uh, so one thing we can do and I, I will be doing is, you know, try to look at the most ordinary geometry. So triangles would be very ordinary. Um, uh, there's so many things you can do with a triangle, especially like the center of a triangle. There's so many ways to define the center of a triangle based on the sides, based on the angles, based on all kinds of funky things you can do with it. Uh, I, 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 I will be, I will have to master that. Uh, circles, uh, like, so you could almost say that all of geometry is really just about triangles. I think I, in a certain sense, I'll try to argue that. So the counter argument would be, well, what about circles? You know, because circles do have a rich history of geometry. Rectangles, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but rectangles just seem pretty dull and boring, you know. So, but who's to say? But see, finite fields is something else to be aware of. Um, that's not really a different shapes, but it's more about the different uh, contexts, you know, different uh, different worlds, so to speak. So that's a good thing to, uh, to think about. Um, but uh, when I was talking about this anti-geometry, there's a field with one element, like an imaginary field with an element. Because, see, uh, if you have seven elements, that'd be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then when you get to seven, seven equals zero. If you have two elements, which is like binary numbers, you have zero and one, and then two is equal to zero. If you have one element, then you just have zero. And then one is the same as zero. And I would think even like infinity is the same as zero, right? I think so. So you have zero and one infinity, all are the same thing. Well, then that is um, uh, curious because the whole point of a field is you're supposed to say zero and one are different, you know, because addition and multiplication have to kind of be teased apart. So, but the, the weird thing is, so this thing doesn't really exist. It's mythical. It's the mythical field with one element. But, uh, and John Bias has shown this, other people have shown this, like, if you uh, do study like a finite field and you have um, the prime number be Q, okay? And so then you do all kinds of counting things. You're gonna get polynomials in Q. Well, if you set the Q equal to one, you're going to get the answers that correspond to the case, not of a vector space, let's say with subspaces, but like you'll get the answers that correspond to a set with subsets, for example. This thing's kind of, collapse in some kind of degenerate way like it all kind of it all kind of like makes sense like it's like these dots are connected but they, it's just that the, there's no ink in the pen <laughs> you know like there's it shouldn't exist somehow like there's not supposed to 
it's very curious. So for me, it's fantastic. Like if I want to model God, right? And to say, well, for God, you know, zero and one and infinity, it's all the same thing. God is a state of contradiction where all things are true. You see, it's just begging to be used to model God. Okay. Now, one place, uh, why did I go off on this? Uh, I'm thinking, oh, well, again, this relates to Bhat Paradisi. You see Bhat Paradisi is doing Grassmannians. Grassmannians are talking about vector spaces and subspaces. Uh, that's talking about, let's say, in the case of finite fields, you're getting these uh, polynomials that are counting things. And so if you have this field with one element, you see, you can talk about, well, what are the spaces, subspaces of spaces, which is really like sets, subsets of sets, and you enter the set world. So that's one reason. Um, another thing is, um, and this is where I wanted to go with the anti-geometry, is these random matrix uh, ensembles. So one of the things that gets organized with bod periodicity, which is very metaphysical, and, and you'll see, you know, I'm trying to relate it to these divisions of everything that I call, like basically the mental states that relate our unconscious, conscious, consciousness. Uh, what are they actually thinking about? They're thinking about existence, which might have, let's say, two points of view, like, you know, free will and fate, or like, you know, opposites coexist, like maybe this chair exists or doesn't exist. I'm asking the question, but if it exists, then it exists. That's fate. Let's say that's the way it is. Uh, so I need, that's the answer, the definitive answer. So you need to be able to ask a question, you have answers. You need to have two states in your mind. When you have those two states, then your consciousness and your conscious and your unconscious are all able to focus on that, let's say, and then kind of like add perspectives and maybe shift the clock further. But um, there's this uh, picture of bot periodicity that I'm hoping, you know, or at least investigating, like, does it match up? Well, bot periodicity relates to the physics of CPT symmetry, which is a uh, charge conjugation, parity, and time reversal. Now, these things uh, are very physical, but they're also very metaphysical. So, for example, what charge conjugation is saying, it's saying, well, uh, will the universe, uh, you know, would the, if you did the following and this is kind of like a geometric approach to the universe. Like, um, if you, let's start with time reversal, might be a little bit simpler. Um, if you took time in this universe and you just switch the direction, right? Just switch the direction. Would everything hold as before? Like, you know, would, would it all be the same physical laws, let's say, in place, right? Uh, could you tell, right? And so uh, this, you know, and it turns out like you can create situations. I think they can even do this lab, like where it, it, there's not going to be any difference. You know, and certainly certain physical laws, like they don't care, like the planets going around the sun in a certain sense, uh, Newton's uh, gravitational law doesn't care if they're going forwards or if they're going backwards. There's really no distinction between forwards and backwards. And you couldn't tell, you know, looking which one's quote unquote real and which one's not. So you're allowed to swap the time direction in that. Now, of course, if you smash an egg, uh, it doesn't look the same, you know, because, um, um, and then it gets very complicated, like in terms of notions of entropy and the, the second law of thermodynamics and, and, and information states and all that, like to describe that. And there can be other things that maybe aren't so statistical even, but the, the whole question is like, uh, does time reversal make a difference or not? Well, if, if you can have time reversal symmetry, then there's no... Um, there's no um, becoming, okay? Things Becoming doesn't make sense. Well, that's a metaphysical concept, right? There's no how, let's say. And in general, I'd say like there's no knowledge, right? Like, you know, if you're just, if if, if time is kind of like uh, uh, all the same, like there's no, um, hmm, why is there no knowledge? I'm not entirely clear on that. That's something I think. But see, like, if there's not, then then there's a how, there can be a why, you know, maybe there can be a what, there can be a whether. So there can be these, this whole issue of knowledge. Um, in the case of, well, you know, I'll, I'll go and show the diagram later, um, pick up on that when we talk about bot periodicity. But the point being that it turns out that these different types of uh, symmetries, they come, they, they can be derived from random matrix ensembles, from the symmetry of randomness, you see. That if you want to talk about matrices with their entries being random, but maybe you want to impose particular qualities on those, like let's say that they're symmetric matrices or they're symmetric with regard to the complex numbers, let's say, you know, which means that you'd want to conjugate them, let's say. 
you impose these different types of things. Well, the types of things you'd want to impose on, uh, and, and maintain randomness with uh, are very limited. And, um, and so uh, those things ground uh, the CPT symmetry, they they kind of are participating in this bot periodicity. And so um, if you want to create something random, you see it's very interesting, like uh, those are kind of like the shells for randomness. Uh, so that's something that I want to think about. So it's interesting like to think like, okay, so how is that the, uh, where does that kick into the opposite of geometry? Hmm. Okay, or maybe like the pre-geometry or et cetera, things to think about. And now the heart of the matter, um, really to get a feel for what geometry is, um, is, and this is related to like knowing all of math. Like, so if I was going to do a miracle with math for wisdom and with the language of wisdom, I call wondrous wisdom. One miracle I think that I hope would be impressive would be, uh, and it's a good challenge, you know, so I learn a lot. Can I show how all of math with all of its branches and concepts and theorems and problems and uh, questions, you know, it and objects like how it all unfolds, starting with a very most simple math and then just kind of unfolds in different directions, like, you know, the algebraic direction, the geometric direction, the logical direction, the combinatorial direction is just unfolding, unfolding all these questions, right? Like, what are the questions you start with in math and then how does it just keep going and going and going? Okay. So that is interesting. And so geometry is certainly one of those directions and geometry may actually be very key. And so we'll just uh, look at some sources um, that, uh, you know, Wikipedia is just fantastic. You know, so you have thousands of contributors. They're just waiting to create new pages. And so you get lists of pages. And so you get a list of theorems. You get lists of branches uh, or types of geometry. You get lists of concepts and invariants and problems. So... I think you get the sense of like, there's these so many ways to investigate. Why don't I give a little bit more now about my motivation, right? And we'll see like, why? Why would I care about this? But it's kind of interesting. But I think part of, partly I care just to show, you know, or because I care, I take the opportunity just to show like, wow, you can come up with lots of ways to investigate. And then you can decide which ones you want to do uh, and how you would do them, right? So, um, Let's look here at my motivations. So the map of the branches of mathematics, then the ways of figuring things out in mathematics. And then this is a talk I gave in Lithuanian about the four classical Lie groups and, and their combinatorial uh, foundations, overviewing bot periodicity. And then finally, a geometry of moods evoked by Wu Zhui poems of the Tang Dynasty. So this will also go back to those triangles. Okay, so let's do one at a time. So here, this was maybe like in 2017 or so when I, I have a PhD in math back from 1993, but really I'm, I'm a thinker, I'm a philosopher. Uh, so and math didn't seem quite relevant as I was working through the metaphysics, but uh, about 2016, I said I wanted to go back, maybe take up this challenge. And uh, then I realized, oh, if I can show where these cognitive frameworks that I'm excited about come up in math, then maybe people will want to believe that there could be a language of wisdom, an expression of absolute truth, uh, and that those frameworks uh, maybe appear, okay? So, so one of the things I did on trying to size up all of mathematics is to say, well, I'd like a map, and to kind of maybe draw some conclusions from that map. And so what I did was uh, I thought, well, what are the branches of mathematics? And... Um, there are uh, journals, of course, thousands of thousands of journals out there, I think. But they uh, get um, they have abstracts. They get put into um, just uh, databases so people could discover your work. And uh, often, um, well, basically, there's a code. There's a coding system for mathematics. Uh, and I think internationally, the one that I used was maybe 65 different branches of mathematics. And it probably, like, if you wanted to get more detailed, it might be like 600, you know, sub-branches. So maybe that's something to look at. Maybe if you look at that for geometry, well, actually might be now that I think about that. Uh, but um, for ge now, okay, so you have a list of 60, and then what do you do with them? Well, one thing is to ask, okay, which branch depends on which other branches? Because one branch of geometry might be quite independent, okay? So if you start down here, like, and I don't know if this is a good example, let's say proof theory. Okay, uh, well, of course, if you're studying proof theory, it's proofs 
you know, proofs from somewhere. But a lot of it might be very simple elementary proofs. You really don't have to go deep into the literature here. Like, you know, you could just be proving very, very simple things like one plus one equals two even. So, uh, or computability theory, maybe it's quite independent. Um, but, um, or like put down here geometry as such, you know, at least in my understanding, like it's just geometry, right? Combinatorics, okay? Set theory, so these are low. Um, now, um, model theory in logic, okay? Now at the very top would be, let's say number theory. Or I even put computational number theory, but like analytic number theory, algebraic number theory, like huge. They're just building on like the whole of mathematics. Like everything is game. Everything's a possible tool for that. Okay. So let's maybe walk up some of these branches. Like to say the real functions, complex functions. Okay. I don't know if that's true, but like if 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 you're working with a complex one, actually it may work both ways. You know, you can get results on the real functions by stepping outside the box, right? But maybe you don't have to. Uh, so this side, uh, like complex functions, approximation theory in the complex domain, several complex variables in analytic spaces, okay? Special functions, orthogonal polynomials, um, climbing up this way. Here, like real functions, sequences, series, summability, derivatives and integrals, ordinary differential equations, partial differential equations, potential theory, optimization, calculus of variations, and optimal control. You're kind of climbing up this way. It gets maybe more powerful here. Functional analysis is very powerful. Operator theory. You know, and, uh, I think a lot of what I was doing here, so, you know, not that I understand all these terms, um, you know, in any in any any way or any sophisticated way, but, you know, just sitting down with Wikipedia, which is a wonderful resource, and just say, okay, what is Wikipedia? How does it define it? And from that definition, what is it, what seem to be the prerequisites, right? You know, infinite dimensional holomorphy, operator theory. So operator theory. So I'm saying it's coming from points of topology. So here, again, so you can see this is like an analytic wing of the uh, of the of the universe here. Now here would be, let's say, set theory, category theory, order theory, algebraic logic, uh, the general algebraic systems, model theory, okay, group theory, topological groups. Well, of course, you know, uh, okay, so topological groups are building on group theory. Uh, Non-associative rings and non-associative algebras, uh, commutative rings and algebras. Well, in some sense, you know, rings build on groups. Uh, um, homological algebra, algebraic topology, uh, K theory. Now K theory is very advanced. You know, the, you need to, it's it's algebraic topology and algebraic geometry and you're coming up here, right? So, um, uh, and so from geometry up to algebraic geometry, from geometry up to differential geometry, from geometry up to convex geometry, up to discrete geometry, okay? That's where, that's basically the kinds of geometries that seem to be at play here. And then you're going, but if maybe the thing I really wanted to um, say was at the heart of this would be Lie groups, okay? And so you see like one side is very much analytic where you're talking about, uh, well, the continuum, um, but the real numbers, uh, functions, uh, real functions, let's say, and complex functions and that whole, let's say, maybe even the world of these functions, let's say. The other is algebraic, where things may be discrete uh, or they may simply be um, kind of like step-by-step -step thinking, right? So, whereas analysis like the thinking is, uh, doesn't, isn't step-by-step, -step, it's like infinite sequences of thinking, so to speak, right? Like you're dealing with sequences and series is going forever, let's say. You're, at least that's, the, that's how you allow things to be set up. So, but however wrong I may be, but... Um, Lie groups are, Lie algebra, Lie theory is somewhere here uh, in the middle, connecting it. And that's based on the definition. It's groups that are on mana, that are also manifolds. They have this dual type of uh, ambiguity. Enough about this, but you get this. So when I, what I realized was that, okay, Lie groups, um, so first of all, like they're very central, but they're also very concrete. Like there's not that many different kinds of Lie groups. You see, they're very special. They're highly symmetric um, and they're very central. Okay, so let's take a look at. Um, once I had that in mind, 
and that was about 2000, maybe 17 or so I did that. But even before that, I had uh, studied the ways of figuring things out in my own philosophy. No one cared about my results, but I thought, well, what maybe they would care how I figured things out. You know, I've like, done like 200 investigations on different philosophical questions uh, with these cognitive approach so i i've got like just dozens and dozens and dozens uh you know maybe 200 ways of, of figuring things out and i organized them i got this beautiful 24-fold system then i said well why don't i do it with math and i basically got the same system and i've done it maybe for 10 different things neuroscience biology um, chess let's say you always come up with the same thing you know jesus is thinking let's say uh the gone of vilna so the point is, is that um, if you look at uh, problem solving, um, and I used, um, mm, well, I used, you know, there's chess Olympiads and there's books. Uh, and there's really a great book by, um, um, that basically about that, The Art and Craft of Problem Solving by Paul Zeitz. Okay. So that's a wonderful uh, text. Uh, and so I studied it as a philosopher, you know, like, well, what are the patterns? You know, also George Polya, how to solve it, right? And so I made the system of the patterns in solving problems in math. And there's an algebraic one where it says, like, if you have a sheet of paper, you can, you know, if you, you can basically, you know, one way to solve problems, you figure out what's the center of the, you know, what's, where do you put your coordinate system? And maybe balance, you know, or parity, and then maybe polynomials like sets of roots and then vector spaces would be like lists like a basis is a list of vectors let's say this is way these are algebraic ways of thinking analytic waves would be like you could do induction let's say with a sequence okay induction is a method you could have uh, maximal or minimal elements on that sequence you could have least upper bounds greatest lower bounds and you could have limits and when you pull it out and the way you put it together you get like um you extend the domain uh, you make arguments by continuity. You do a self-superimposed sequence. Um, you know, we get draw a pattern from that. And then you can say, okay, that held on this domain. I'll do it on a bigger domain. You know, you keep trying to, this is the motor that runs the soul of, let's say, the system. But the observer, the, the one that, like, the independent trials is basically, like, how you start. It's just saying, like, you can always rip up your paper and do another sheet of paper and just keep going. So, which is helpful for statistics for other things also, but, you know, just, it's also as helpful as a problem solving, like, let's just start fresh, you know. Um, but um, this idea of the symmetry group um, to say, well, uh, that's at the heart of math mathematics is like to, uh, how do you configure things? You know, what are the, in terms of system of actions that you can take? Okay, so express your system as a bunch of different uh, actions that you can take, and that language will tell you what to do. And then it turns out, so these others were all pre-systemic, but like once you have a system, which starts like with this, something like a symmetry group, then you can look at your uh, problem solving within an existing system. Now there'll be a level and a meta level, and there's uh, four ways they may be related. Uh, so uh, they may be the same, in which case you can do like uh, proof by contradiction. Okay, that's why this truth. They may be a little bit different than um, you can have like a model. So like you do a two-dimensional version before you try the three-dimensional version. You know, you do a simpler version, let's say. You make things simpler and then you do the more hard case. Uh, implicate, implication, uh, you can think backwards. So you start with um, where you want to go and then you can work backwards. Well, how can I get there? Okay. And then variable, I think it's like, oh, I'll be able to, talk i gave a talk once about like 24 different ways of looking at variables okay so when you draw a picture there's this kind of ambiguity you know you can think of a variable in two different ways let's say as a whether it's a the thing or the, an icon or an index or a symbol you can think of the variables in your mind in a couple of different ways uh, and that's maybe how you solve the problem and then the point is that uh, you can pair these up in six ways and that gives you all these types of visualizations. And I won't go through them all, but like it could be like a power set lattice of conditions, for example, you play with. It could be like factoring, let's say, uh, different things. And then finally, it's context, where sometimes you realize, you know, this isn't making sense. I need to redo the context. So if, if, if I ask you, what's 10 plus 4? And you say 14, and I go, no, there's no 14, <laughs> you know. And you're just wondering, like, what's he talking about? And then you realize, oh, 10 plus 4 is 2 because I'm thinking of a 12 hour clock. You got to change the context, okay? So 
this is just the general system. But I thought, well, where does geometrical thinking come up here? First of all, you know, do we do geometrical thinking and problem solving? Um, because, uh, and you'll see a video I have called uh, Deep Structure and uh, Surface Structure. The surf superficially, you might have a geometrical problem, like let's say uh, uh, Euclid's uh, drawing an equilateral triangle. But when you draw it, you have to use your compass. You draw one circle, you draw another circle. Well, what you're really thinking about is conditions, you know, that I need to draw two circles because I need to, that the, the point I'm trying to find needs to lie on those two circles. So it needs to meet both conditions or there's, you know, but there could be one condition or another condition or could be no conditions. And that's a lattice of, uh, so really of conditions. So that's really a power set lattice of conditions. That's what I'm using to solve the problem. And if I don't have that lattice in my mind, I can't solve it. I can draw all I want. It's not going to happen. So, or maybe accidentally, I guess, uh, but you still have to interpret it. So that's the thing that needs to click. These are all the, the ways. That, and so these things that click in the mind, these are pre-axiomatic math. These are things that don't, they're not on the paper. They're in the mind. They don't need to be axiomatic. They just, they're hardwired into us which is like, so where is geometry hardwired into us? So one hypothesis is that, well, it's these four places, these logical places, like that's where uh, geometry is being um, um, rooted, let's say. That's just kind of like a question mark I have, right? Um, and so then when I found out, um, oh, that, you know, these Lie groups are so central and oh, there are four different kinds. Now, ignore the Lithuanian, unless you have no Lithuanian. It's, of course, a beautiful language. But uh, it, this is a talk I gave uh, to the Lithuanian Mathematical uh, Society. You know, everyone gives their talks. And here I'm looking at the Lie, the Dinkin diagrams of the Lie groups. And these are the classical families. So uh, these are the, the boring, let's say, <laughs> Lie groups. Uh, classical Lie groups, but they're, they're the ones I'm interested in because I'm looking at the things that are boring and basic and trying to explain them. Lots of people would prefer to talk about the exceptional uh, Lie groups. Uh, there's like five that don't fit into any kind of infinite pattern. Um, maybe we'll talk about one of them today. This is G2 at the end. But um, these are the um, these are the uh, four Dinka diagrams. What do they stand for? Well, they're standing for... Um, uh, basically, um, one way to think about them is they stand for rotations. Okay, now that's not really talking about them all, but in a certain sense, it's talking about the, the key, key, key versions. Uh, so, like if you have orthogonal groups, let's say, right, that'd be like, well, how can you take a ball, which could be a circle? I think that'd be, uh, well, I won't even say, I'll be careful. You take a circle or you could take a ball. Let's, I mean, a, a sphere is more accurate mathematically. And you could rotate, like you want to, what could you do to it? How could you transforming it without changing the distances, let's say, okay? You could rotate it in any way. It's not going to change the distances between two points. And furthermore, you could actually reflect, okay? If you reflect across uh, so that like North Pole becomes South Pole and the same across, well, that'll be interesting, but it's not going to affect the distances between two points. If you reflect twice, you get back to where you started. So you get like two families. You get rotations, and then you get reflection plus rotations. Basically, you get this kind of like, uh, and it's smooth. You know, you can smoothly move from every, it's continuous. You can move from every rotation to every other rotation. Um, now, you can do that with the real, what would be called orthogonal group. But you could also do it using complex number uh, as your uh, inner I guess as your inner product, as your as your space. Let's say you could do it in complex numbers, and you would have an inner product over the complex numbers, and so then that would be called unitary. And you could also do it over uh, quaternions, okay, which are four dimensional, and then that would give you symplectic. Now there's so much to learn about this. You know, I can only give uh, you know my feeble intuition, but uh, unitary turns out like the complex case is the most basic and fundamental. Uh, and so, like, if you look at rotations, um, basically it look like e to the i theta, e to the minus i theta, let's say. Uh, but you'd, you'd, you'd get uh, e to the i theta is a very compact way to do it, very natural. For real numbers, you'd need two by two matrices to do that. So it would be uh, like cosine theta, minus sine theta, I think sine theta, cosine theta, something like that. Um, and then if you had an extra dimension in the real case, then... Um, 
you would just have a fixed extra axis, okay? So, um, which doesn't move. So that just kind of says that the odd case of the orthogonal groups and the even orthogonal groups are actually different and they lead to different geometries, I'm hoping. You know, I think, you, I'm just wondering like what's what's deep inside of this. Then um, um, the unitary case and then the symplectic case. Um, and the symplectic case would be, it really comes up like in classical mechanics, uh, you, you can know the position of a particle, but you also want to know the momentum. So there may be, let's say, it could even be one dimension position, but you'd want to know one dimension, the speed or the, you know, the momentum of that particle to define what's going on in your dynamical system. It's for dynamical systems. And so you get these phase spaces. And so like, you know, if you have a pendulum swinging and uh, it's swinging uh, or like a spring moving, let's say oscillating, um, if it's in the center, the position is zero, perhaps, but the momentum is maximum. But then at the edge, the momentum becomes zero, but the position is maximum. And if you draw those two dimensions, uh, position and momentum, you'll see like a, uh, you'll see like an ellipse, let's say being formed. It's going around an ellipse. And if you kind of tweak it, um, maybe in a certain way, like it may conserve that area of that ellipse. Okay, and so there's this whole notion. So in the symplectic case, you're dealing with oriented areas. In the case of unitary, uh, you get, I think, like co uh, conformal geometry in many cases. I think it's very tightly related to that. And so that's uh, where angles don't change. Okay, things may scale in funny ways, but the angles aren't changing. And then in, um, so my hunch, I'll just say it is like, you know, I'm thinking that uh, these are encoding um, you know, I forget which one, I think like BN and DN are encoding the odd and the even uh, uh, or the other way around uh, uh, orthogonal groups. Uh, and so I think that they're affine and projective geometries that they're underlying. You know, that's probably wacky to think that, but that's what I'm kind of thinking. The AN is the classic vanilla. That would be um, for um, this uh, unitary uh, and conformal geometry, I'm thinking. And then uh, um, DN would be... Um, the symplectic geometry. I don't know, but see, that's what we're trying to figure out. Like, but the point being is that there's not many. You see, there's. It's very strict. It's very. It's very. Uh, not many, and uh, correspond to this. Uh, they have these root systems, and then they have these vial groups uh, that uh, are transformations on the symmetries of these root systems, etc. Well, if you build them up, you get. Um, these are the symmetries of um, the infinite polytopes. So one example would be the simplexes. And the simplexes here are these, like what you can, the ways you build up a triangle. And I've made, um, basically, I think of, you know, the binomial portal is a theorem to your mind is something that I created a video on well, with the help of Kirby and uh, Ryan uh, at Math for Wisdom. But uh, the binomial theorem gets coded into here. But that very same binomial theorem gets coded into this cube if you put it on its side. And the difference is, and that's what that video was about, basically, like here, if you put a cube on its side, you can have all plus or all minus, let's say all arrows to the left or all arrows to the right, and, you know, or you could have two one way, one the other, and so. But that's symmetric, you see. It's semantic. It's just you could change the names. You could change the understanding. You could just flip it around. It's not going to. See, whereas uh, here, you're coding whether to include a vertex or not in all the ways. Like, so if you have three here, you include all three. Okay, that's a triangle. But if you only include two, you'll get a side in three different ways. If you only include one, you'll get a point. If you include none of them, you'll get what I call the center. Okay. And so the center and the whole thing, those are opposites. Okay, that's not symmetric. That's a syntactic difference. And so with Clifford algebras, we see that too. We have an identity and then we have a pseudoscalar or you multiply all the generators. So this comes up in this kind of case. Now, instead, you could also, instead of a, you could add these factors of two, which is basically saying, like, let's say you choose to put in an axis or not. And so you'll get the cross polytopes or you'll get the cubes. And so I've written all this out. And so here's like these different choices. That's why I call them choice frameworks. You see, these are different ways of, so three of these are infinite polytopes. This one's not considered an in infinite polytope here. It's not really creating shapes in that way. But it is creating these uh, choices, you know, like you make a choice, you make another choice, you make another choice. It's like a choice system. So I'm trying to claim that maybe cognitively there are these four choice systems. 
okay? And they're lurking behind these Lie groups, maybe. You see, that's where I want to go. And if you look at the root systems, and I've talked about this elsewhere, uh, but um, it's different ways of coding the duality of counting forwards and backwards. And then you get, um, you can look at how the inverse matrices work and they're, instead of doing all the usual very complicated machinery Kramer's rule for calculating inverse, it becomes very simplified. Uh, you just transform, you switch, you know, uh, AIJ and AJI, and you switch them and you'll, or, you know, or you may have to conjugate, let's say, but you do something very simple to calculate the inverse. So, um, so it's like inverting an arrow, basically saying just, in, so that's very nice and slick and interesting. So this is where um, uh, combinatorics of um, uh, this loop. And so where, why do I care about this? Well, like what I'd like to do, you know, here, uh, if you've listened to the wondrous wisdom, you may have seen this eight cycle of the cognitive frameworks. And here it's like reflection. What I was calling culture, I think, is just like reflection plus one. And what I was calling the innate is uh, reflection on reflection is plus two. And then what I'm calling that intrinsic, right, uh, is plus three. It's a reflection on reflection on reflection. But basically, you're doing these shifts on these cognitive frameworks. And my bold leap of faith is to say, well, maybe that is bot periodicity. You got to learn it. But by periodicity, one way to look at it is that it's these quotients, and these are Lie groups. The O is the orthogonal, the U is a unitary, the SP is the symplectic. You're getting these uh, Grassmannians that are quotients of one group over another group. Uh, they are different flavors of Grassmannians. And so I really need intuition of a very deep cognitive nature to say, well, what is that? Uh, that's what I'm trying to do. You know, this is my motivation. Why? Uh, here's just that CPT. Um, argument saying that, well, like, what's charge conjugation? I talked to you about um, uh, reversing time, saying that, well, if you if, if you can reverse time, then there's no notion of becoming. So I just maybe will add here that, like, if you have a particle, charge conjugation, let's say an electron, it's got a charge, charge conjugation would say, well, that's the same, you know, if you switched all the charges of the particles in the universe, it shouldn't make a difference. It shouldn't be noticeable or make a difference. Like, it should... It, it should, the universe should hold as before, should all function. And kind of what that boils down to, at least as I've heard, is that, well, suppose you had a sea of uh, antiparticles and you just had a hole in it. And so in physics, and I do have a bachelor's degree in physics, you can do these calculations where uh, uh, you talk about a virtual electron. Right, but it's really like a hole. But it functions like electrons. Like it has a, it is, it's as if it had a, you know, electro electromagnetic field. You know, then it functions in all this way. So the same way, the algebra works out the same as if it was there. You know, in certain situations, that's the question. You see, so if you have charge conjugation, in a certain sense, it's the same as if it was a hole in the antiparticle C. Now, the problem metaphysically, or the, the uh, consequence metaphysically, is that, well, then being uh, doesn't really um, being doesn't really hang together as a, you know, being, being doesn't really, uh, uh, it gets demoted in a certain sense. Because, like, this is something that is not, a whole is not there. And then this is there. So if charge conjugation doesn't work, it's saying, like, something being there and something not being there, it's different, Right. But if if you have conjugation, it's kind of like, well, just give me a hole, give me a, you know, like I can deal with it either way, right? Like, like, oh, it's my sweetheart. Oh no, it's it's my sweetheart is missing, but it's in an anti-sweetheart scene. It's like, I don't know if that would be equally valid, you know. I don't think so. Okay, so that's the metaphysics. Um, so then um um parity or chirality is like saying clockwise and counterclockwise if you switch that if you had a mirror universe now it turns out uh, and it turns out what the what has been found is that these actually can all be violated and you can have a um, pair you know you can have pairs of these symmetries or individual symmetry whatever like and you can have different exotic matters or situations, which may seem quite artificial, but basically they can be set up. Uh, typically, it might be like an electric. I mean, they talk about topological insulators, so you might have a charge, uh, electric charge, on top of some kind of like a two-dimensional surface on top of a three-dimensional shape, let's say, and then it may have certain properties depending on the topology how you set it up. Beyond me, but um, anyway, so. 
uh, clockwise versus counterclockwise, if it doesn't make a difference, then that's fine. Now, in our universe, it turns out uh, for the weak force, it does make a difference, uh, you know, whether your neutrinos are right-handed or left-handed and et cetera. When you do the calculations, when you do the observations, there's something going on there. Um, and so, um, uh, well, but see, for wondrous wisdom, we had a learning cycle, take a stand, follow through, reflect, and it only goes in one direction. And you can't switch that around, like take a stand, reflect, follow through. That doesn't work. Um, that's the idea. It's not, uh, it's not Cairo like that. You know, there's a definite direction. There's a definite handedness. You know, of course, you can draw it however you like, but that has a handedness. So it turns out that all of these symmetries relate to the most and basically negating they all negate the most basic um, uh, vocabulary, the ABCs of wondrous wisdom, the most uh, fundamental uh, divisions of everything into two perspectives, three perspectives, four perspectives. And if you think of uh, if you think of uh, everything into one perspective, which is kind of like everything, you know, for the for order for whatever, and you add one reflection or two reflections or three reflections, that's how you get the two, some three, some four, some. Okay. So when the unconscious or like what we're talking about culture, when that looks at uh, everything, it would look in terms of existence. But when the uh, uh, innate, which I call the conscious, right, looks at it, it look in terms of learning. But when the intrinsic looks at it, that would look in terms of knowledge, right? That's just how it looks. Why not? It seems to kind of be in the right direction. So this is where I want to go. This is why I want to learn uh, what is geometry, because uh, that will um, that will give me intuition, you know, that will kind of steer me correct, okay? And of course, you know, I don't want to be um, driveling and I don't want to be BSing, you know, it's uh, I'm just hypothesizing. So I want to learn, maybe I'm wrong, right? Uh, but maybe I'm right, and maybe I could be more right. So, um, I've basically given you, here's my long list of investigations that I made that diagram from. Oh, I do need to show you one more motivation. A geometry of moods evoked by Wu Jui poems of the Tang Dynasty. So, you know, I, I investigate all kinds of things. I investigate the emotional life. And if you uh, listen to this talk or read this presentation, uh, it's on the video. But the crucial thing here is that there's a boundary in people which distinguishes like whether something, you know, if an expectation is not met, but are you surprised or are you sad? If it's beyond you, outside of you, you know, like, so if it's something I don't really care about, I don't really know about it, you know, I'm surprised that, oh, I got that wrong. Okay, I learned. But if it turned out there's two, some, three, some, four, so I just is completely baloney, I think it'd be sad, you know. There's nothing there. Like I, I can't even comprehend that that would happen. Uh, I think if I, did, I, I could curl up and cry, <laughs> right? So, you know, it's how we're attached. Where where that line is, where that boundary is. That's geometrical. And so then, what I did is I looked at uh, poetry as data. So you know, this is uh, science, right? You look data, and look at classic poetry, uh, thirty-seven uh, four. Uh, four line poems uh, from the Tang Dynasty, you know, which is really classic, and these really great poems. And then it turns out when you read them, they do seem very geometrical, actually. So I go, hmm. And so I came up with um, six ways of grouping them based on the transformation involved. And then I kind of organized them. And here it is. Uh, so the transformations, you know, some of them are like you reflecting across that boundary, and some of them is your sheer. Um, it would just kind of show, like, so you like, here you're reflecting across the boundary, you're talking to the moon. <laughs> here you're watching some lovely lady through the window who's looking, you know, off, maybe thinking not about, you know, doesn't see you, but thinks about her, her lover who jilted her. Here it would be um, rotating, you know, as you switch from looking at one thing to another. Uh, here it could be dilating as your scope uh, changes, maybe grows broader. Here it could be squeeze, where like you're uh, um, you're making comparisons. So squeeze, like you know, if you change the shape of a rectangle, uh, so it's uh, maybe narrow this way, but it would have an equal area if it was narrow that way. And so you're re re changing that area um, where uh, you're doing trade-offs, so to speak. Right? 
That'd be a squeeze. In other words, would be translation. Let's say you're moving across terrain, right? So these are all just, I think you can believe that they could have emotional impact uh, uh, on your system. And so what are they doing here? Well, I'm saying that uh, you can get those six by looking at uh, a triangle in different ways. So there being four ways of looking at a triangle. One is that there's three paths that you go around the triangle. Another is that you can have three intersecting lines, and thus you have intersecting points. That's, uh, And then you could have uh, three angles, and then you could sweep the area around. Okay, you could sweep it around. And so then I'm saying that, well, those are three, maybe this is even like a position, and then you have like a momentum, let's say, that uh, is kind of like, a, uh, I don't know, maybe made that up, I don't know. But the... But the point, anyways, the point is like oriented areas are the basic to a uh, symplectic uh, geometry, and they have an inner product that preserves uh, oriented areas, if I understand correctly. A conformal uh, geometry is based on angles and has a metric uh, inner product that is, you know, where if that's would be, pres you know, preserving that inner product means you're preserving angles. Um, projective geometry is um, preserving uh, distances, I think, I hope. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> Look things up. That's what I'm saying. I'm here to give you a general, you know, understanding of how to investigate things, how I investigate things. Maybe we can, of course, you know, maybe we could work together. Maybe you know things better than me. That'd be fantastic. And then affine geometry, not something I really understand, but basically affine geometry seems to be like, you know, the geometry where... <clears throat> You don't have a coordinate system, let's say, like with a zero. It's kind of like a geometry without the zero. So that would mean that um, you're working, you don't have an intrinsic um, system. So measurement becomes different, uh, problematic. I'm not going to say more. I'll make a video about it. I'll, I'll work on it. So the point is, is that if you do reflection, you know, you're, you're basically making each of those transformations is cognitively, quantitatively specifying something more. So something that was just paths becomes intersections. That's what ideas, I think, was saying reflections does. But uh, Shear says it's not just paths, but it is becoming angles. Okay. A angles become relevant. You know, I'm looking at you, but you're looking at somebody else. Let's say. Uh, so you're adding angles. Um, translation is adding, let's say, areas. That's what I was uh, saying. And then I'm saying that the rotation is taking the projective, let's say, and adding angles. Um, it's taking a squeeze is taking the projective and making it areas, kind of like I was saying, like reshaping. And then uh, dilation is taking, let's say, angles and then playing around, like, let's say, with, you know, allowing you to play around with areas. This is just a picture I have, uh, but this is where I want to go. Like, okay, that's a picture, and it worked out all right for my uh, my analysis here. But actually, you know, deeper, like, hey, like, what what does the geometry say? Okay, could this really be uh, fundamental to geometry? And so, um, oh, this is probably I linked it to the, not the most latest version, but basically, it turns out those are Mobius transformations, and so. Uh, they're, they can all be thought of uh, mapping a sphere to a sphere in ways where like a circle would get mapped to a circle. So it's like saying that if you're if that circle is the boundary between you and the world, you're on one side of the circle, the world is on the other side of the circle, and then all these transformations are respecting that. That's fascinating. Okay. And that's huge. And saying, saying it's, it's reducing this complicated thing to a the, basically the simplest of things, which is a circle on a sphere, right? Wow. Okay. So, and that's believable in the mind that, you know, like your emotional life is just playing with a circle on a sphere. I don't think that that's so uh, crazy to think that that's a very nice uh, way to head in direction. So these are the investigations I want to do. I kind of went through them. I kind of basically told you my motivation Maybe why don't I tell you a little bit more like um, uh, where is the, um, you know, so this idea of uniformity of choice. You can see I was thinking about the choice frameworks and then I kind of realized, oh, 
you know, in the word homogeneous comes up in geometry, which basically means like you have the same power. Like, so you could have things being quadratic, like X, Y plus Y, Z. Those are all second order, let's say. I think that's how homogeneous is used. Uh, although in projective geometry is also this idea of homogeneous coordinates. So that's something too. But the point being that uh, I like that idea, uniformity of choice. And here are these choice frameworks and the idea of like what's happening when you add a dimension. And the idea being that uh, when you look at those Dinkin diagrams for those classical Lie groups, um, it's all about like when you, you know, forwards and backwards counting should be dual. But like what historians can do is that they can link that up and say, oh, yeah, we need to count forward in time, but we also want to count backward. But we're going to have a year zero. We're going to combine them, you see, where it's all one long string. Okay. It's not like two parallel, you know, parallel systems. No, they're going to be combined. Uh, see, so now that's a new way of thinking. So you could have negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. But there's other ways to do that, uh, but not many. So you could take negative one and one, say that's going to be the same. Negative one and one are, are different names for the same thing. So you have negative three, negative two, negative one. And then you basically hop to two because uh, one and negative one is the same. So negative one goes straight to two, right? Uh, because one, or, you know, going backward, two is one, but that's just negative one. So you go negative two. And then, or you could just have it very clean, which would be like folding it. Okay, so negative three, negative two, negative one, one, two, three. See, and so those are being coded by those four. That's very basic, right? You could have them separate, you know, or you could have an extra zero which is like that extra dimension that the uh, odd ones will have because uh, you can't have two by two matrices. You know, you're going to have an extra dimension or you could fuse them or, or you could fold them. And if you fold them, you get this kind of like fourfold thing because there's, it's not clear which, you know, you can map them up however you like. I think that's how I kind of think. So Anyways, so the point being like some kind of simple things like that they're all like, what happens when you're trying to come up with a generic way of adding a dimension, right? And so in that bot periodicity, like when you think about, um, at least I'm starting to think, like when I think about um, um, these uh, Lie groups in the context of bot periodicity, like you'll have O infinity, you'll have U infinity, you'll have SP infinity. But like O infinity has these two branches. And uh, what that's saying um, with regard to this You know, I forget, but somehow like idea, like this, this idea of adding a dimension and how you can do that, like you see, I think that plays over very much into the Lie group aspect. Let me just say that. <clears throat> and so how to kind of show how that connects with the different ways, you know, the invariance that you're preserving and the kind of different ways you're looking at that triangle, right? So there's a very nice um, article answer, basically, I read at core, I think it read it. Somebody answered a question. I think their name is uh, Tarzenix. We'll come to that quickly. But they said, look, geometry is about rigidifying structure. So topology, things are loose. With geometry, you want things to have some kind of rigidity. You know, so, so you could have figures. And so like if you look up uh, in Wikipedia, you know, or in a dictionary, like what is geometry? They may say like it's the study of figures. So figures need to be have a rigid shape, you know, so that you could have congruence. So you could say, hey, this is the same figure or this is a different figure. And so you end up with uh, some kind of constraint like a distance constraint, a metric. But the metric could be for distances, could be for angles, could be for these oriented areas. But not for many things, it seems. There seems to be very much limitations on what those could be. Um, these could be the limitations for a norm division algebras, for example. So... That's these old rigid. And so you get rotations are very important. Like once you have this invariant uh, distance metric, then you can have the concept of rotations and rotations are absolutely basic. So in a certain sense, maybe all of geometry is just rotations. Okay. Uh, curvatures are very important, especially for differential geometry. But one way to think about curvature, uh, which is saying like, you know, you have a curve and then like if you put a circle on it, like what's the size of the circle? Uh, how slowly or rapidly is it curving? Uh, I'm ignorant. Uh, you know, I took a one-quarter course in differential geometry, you know. 
40 years ago, or maybe a little bit less. But so, but I kind of think like, well, curvature is just the opposite of a rotation, you know, like because with a rotation, you have a point and then you're seeing what happens away from the point as you move. Whereas with curvature, you're saying, oh, my curve is moving. Where's the point that it's moving with regard to? And what's maybe happening to that point, such, but where's the point? I think it's just the opposite. That's how I would say. Please correct me. Um, so here are these. And basically, uh, one of the things, like, so in looking for these, uh, maybe this will be the last thing we'll do, um, but um, in looking at these definitions of um, geometry that uh, I managed to avoid today, they're so deep, et cetera. Um, but they're kind of like building what do you need in order to have assemblages and uh, figures, okay? So I talked about the Kantian void. So there's things in category theory. Well, let's just start with me first. I've noticed in classical logic, there's this huge, uh, beautiful duality. Of course, I'm not the only one to notice that, but statements that are true and statements that are not true, let's say, uh, or or not false, or anything, but there's just this, like, there's just this, for every statement that's true, there's an opposite statement that's uh false right it's, it's saying not that right so you get the you get this parallelism between what's true and what's false okay basically in a certain sense you get a duality one way to say the duality is to say like you can think of it as true or you can think of it as not false that would be classical duality there's two ways to talk about these things so topology says hey uh why don't we make it a little bit interesting, you know? And so topology has this notion of, instead of true and false, has a notion like open and closed and sets. So you typically, like you have a bunch of sets, but like some could be open and some could be closed, but you typically don't use all the sets, okay? And the idea is that, you know, and if and the idea is that if it, the complement of the closed is open and the complement of the open is closed. So you have like these two teams, you know, that they're on opposite sides. Now, what's the difference? They're basically very much the same in every absolute way. Only in one way are they different. And so in the case of the open sets, you can take arbitrary unions of uh, open sets, and that'll still be an open set. It gets to be on the open set volleyball team, let's say. But the closed ones, you can take finite unions. And with intersections, the opposite. With the closed ones, you can take arbitrary intersections that'll be on the closed volleyball team let's say but in the in the um open ones you can only take finite uh, and see that little difference between finite and um arbitrary it makes all of topology all of topology like there is nothing else in topology that and first of all it allows you to define continuity in a meaningful way so and so you see, like you're running up against this whole tension between finite and between arbitrary, which is where you get to talk about the continuum, which is where you get to talk about continuity. Okay, so that's not geometry, but that's what you need in order to have the playing field for geometry, basically. Okay, I mean, of course, you could have people make up their definitions as like, but I think I think maybe many would agree with me, like you know, topology is not geometry; geometry is something more, right? And so then what is more? Well, you need to be able to, I guess, assemble certain things. So one thing, uh, when category theory, when they talk about it, one approach is to talk about Isabel duality, which is very um, just abstract and difficult, let's say. But I've learned about adjunctions. I'll be able to tell you what I know about adjunctions. Um, and basically, adjunction is a mathematical analogy, saying that like if you have a relationship in one world, let's say the world of sets, and you have a relationship in another world, like the world of vector spaces, an adjunction will carry over that analogy, and then uh, it'll actually carry it over in both directions. You'll have a functor in one way. You'll have an adjoint functor in the other way. You'll have an adjunction that relates those two functors. Uh, and so and you could have actually, you know, multiple, um, you could have strings, let's say, of these uh, adjunctions. Uh, and I actually, uh, maybe I won't say much about it today, uh, but I actually have a good beginning at classifying adjunctions, a six-fold uh, beginning. Uh, but that's going to be important because uh, there are these different definitions about like how you assemble the, no like what are the notions you need in order to assemble together objects, right? Figures uh, in a, so this is kind of leading to the ideas that like, 
you geometry is something that's happening locally that allows you to set up figures. There's other things like topology that are worrying how globally it all fits together, right? Uh, and that, but geometry only cares that you have the uniformity. If you build up a figure here, it will make sense somewhere else, let's say, or not. But like at least it's it's reasonable to consider. Well, what would it mean over here? Say right, or what would it mean over there? That type of question is a geometric question, right? Like, how can you turn it? How can you move it? How can you? Um, that's a bit of a, uh, that's related to geometry. Once you have a figure, you can analyze your figures, I think. So, but you can see a lot of the ways I'm investigating geometry. They're kind of anthropological. Let's look at what geometers do. Let's look at the history of geometry, like what it's accomplished. Uh, and then we'll do that and we'll start to kind of see what's loaded in here. But the idea is that this is a rich concept. It's not an accidental concept. It's not an arbitrary concept. Um, and so um, maybe just to conclude, like to dash off uh, for the curious, uh, some of these things that we'll have to want to look at. Uh, and maybe to review. So how would I would define geometry? Geometry is the uniformity of choice, right? We got the four choice frameworks. So vector bundles, for example, is something I need to, uh, that's in one way to think of bot periodicity, you know, maybe the most abstract ways in terms of K theory, which is the study of vector bundles over these Lie groups and things like that, okay? Now, okay, so I give up. <laughs> Talk, yeah, that'll take some time to learn. Uh, manifesting logic, okay, this rigidifying structure and this uh, adding an inner product to a vector space, which makes it geometric, you know, quadratic forms, which, uh, you know, these notions of distance, etc., they're very, uh, they're really into being quadratic. So why quadratic? We have to think about that. All kinds of constructions and the tools for the constructions. Notions of congruence and symmetries and equivalences and invariance, those are all kind of relevant. Uh, uh, the Erlangen problem, program is famous. Uh, Felix Klein, uh, who was a pioneer in the um, 19th century uh, study of geometry, um, he uh, had this program saying that, well, geometries, like with these Lie groups, you know, they're based on, they're related to Lie groups because they are related to, um, you have to think in terms of symmetries. So each set of symmetries, like if you can translate your problem or if you can rotate your problem or if you can whatever, that's explaining the space that you have. It's really, uh, tell me the symmetries, I'll tell you the geometry you have. I'm probably not far away from that, but I want to maybe add more constraints. That's, there's a bit more to it than just that. Um, so I'm looking for those additional constraints um, to say what's really geometrical. And so I'd have to argue like why, why others would be not really, or, or, or how are they, you know, what's, what's happening in those other cases, let's say. Uh, so the NLAB, um, this is the hardcore place to look for a lot of things, but just to give an example, like here's Klein geometry, you know, so then they rethink these things in terms of category theory. Okay, and so you can chase this down. This is not the most uh, daunting. The one we want to look at would be, uh, okay, so figures, um, uh, group identification and geometric representation. That's, uh, I think, John Baez, and I think it's James Dolan, uh, you know, uh, they, they've pursued this. It's certainly, everything they do is, of course, worth uh, taking a look at. Uh, linking dimensions, I kind of mentioned, like, well, how do you link the dimensions and, and embed the spaces? Curvature, I mentioned. Um, and dimension, relating spaces, vector space foundations. Now, this is where I want to get to coherent sheaf, okay? Oh, I really want to, so, so this is just in, in algebraic geometry, this is one way, this is very deep, difficult to things that wrote in D categories, ring spaces. So this would be like in algebraic geometry, how they do that. But the in category theory, the one that maybe is super fundamental would be, now here's NLAB geometry. This is the one I want, cohesive topos. And one thing, uh, not just because it's category theory, which, you know, you got to kind of, you know, I'm trying to say there's something really more relevant and maybe uh, much deeper in, than category theory, but then I have to, uh, you know, I have to play, I have to, I have to, I have to take it to them, you know, and say, hey, what about this? But here is this uh, adjunction, set of adjunctions. Um, I, think, I think the one that we want is fourfold. Yeah, right here. 
Now, Grotendieck is the master, uh, and he had this Grotendieck yoga of uh, six kinds of adjunctions. Now, I have to check this and go through them. I'm not right sure, but like, I have my six uh, sets of adjunctions, four plus two. So we'll, we'll have to compare his and mine. But I do have to understand his better, and this has to do with sheaf theory. But basically, like anytime you set up a function, you can... Um, that just introducing a function, you know, from one space to another space gives you this whole logic of uh, how whole sets can get transformed back and forth and et cetera. And those sets have interrelations. And it kind of reminds me of the, what we're talking about, those matroids and groupoids and things like that. Like, you know, they get this whole interrelated logic uh, just from a single function, right? So we need to think about it. And so you get that. And then what this is saying, basically it's saying like this has, if you do that for this function, there are going to be these interpretations uh, of what's going on there in terms of discreteness, co-discreteness. But I think basically you're setting up um, what you need in order to build up figures from figures and things like that. Who knows? Okay. But um, um, and even here, I'm just going to check real quick. Yeah, Hegel. See, they're into Hegel. I think this is maybe Urs Schreiber. I don't know if this law there. But so like this type of notion of being, right? Like, so that too, some, that's how I'm saying being happens. And I think I can show, you know, that it's going to be coming in here. Stay tuned. Okay, so I think that you can see here, uh, just to finish here, schemes, decisive abstract generalizations, non-commutative geometry, spatial intuitions. Wow. You got your money's worth today. I think, you know, at least you can see where I am at, right? So let's say I give us give me a month, you join me. Like, what can we do in a month to figure out what is geometry? I think we'll be happy. So with the it's the start of Hanukkah these days. Uh, so let's bless all those who uh, all those who are friends of God, you know. And let me just to say, like the culture of um, Jews, uh, Jewish believers, Jewish friends, that is, uh, from my point of view, like a paradigm for the culture of independent thinkers, right? So if you say, like, what would it be like if there was a culture of independent thinkers? Well, look at the Jewish culture, look at the Jewish family, uh, look at the Jewish uh, children of God. You know, it can. There's a lot to. There's just a lot to think about. You know, to say, oh, well, hmm, okay. And that is a great gift. Okay, so be strong. Um, and um, I think I maybe a challenge uh, for all of us who are Jewish friends. Uh, and of course, you know, the enormous um, contributions of um, Jews around the world, including Litvox uh, from originally from Lithuania, to mathematics. Uh, is boggling. Uh, I studied uh, Schur functions, among other, other things, uh, for my uh, mathematical thesis, uh, symmetric functions of the eigenvalues of a matrix. And well, of course, many years later, like Schur is uh, a Litvak, I think, you know, he's a Lithuanian Jew. Minkowski, I think, is a Lithuanian Jew. I, it just goes on and on. So that is great. Um, and oh, but let's have a challenge. You know, math for wisdom should be practical. Wondrous wisdom should be practical. You've maybe seen my video on uh, bringing peace to Russia and Ukraine, which is uh, ongoing. And uh, please, um, uh, will be uh, well. Just please, uh, you know, if, if if you want to work on that, always uh, I always care. But I do care about uh, the horrible war in uh, Israel and Gaza. Um, how can we all rise above that? Uh, how can we all um, concern ourselves that Hamas not be in power, that Palestinians have an alternative uh, self-rule that is dignified, uh, that is not uh, dignified, uh, that is simply wrong and uh, not human and really not uh, to be continued, I think, right? Not to be returned, right? So. I think that's part for all of us to, to rise up to that challenge. How do we uh, establish an alternative? Uh, uh, help me, uh, you know, move me. I do have um, 
I have been to uh, Israeli-occupied Palestine. I did teach how to fight peacefully for three weeks. I did show how to do that uh, in 2006, I think it was. Uh, I did not go to Gaza, but I do have uh, colleagues uh, in uh, Palestine I would reach out to. Let's do that. Okay. So concluding with a prayer, uh, let's apply geometry to our world. Peace and love. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I was really surprised. All I did was go to the Patreon webpage fill in a few blanks. Uh, it was basically all automated. And there I was. I was a donor. And I, I mean, two euros a month, that's that's really nothing. Uh, I'm getting a lot out of Math for Wisdom. And I think you will too.